It's really about time, and we're gaining momentum every day. So, um, all right, here we go. I'm Megan. I'm a storyteller, dot connector, creative collaborator, team player, human highlighter, and a catalyst for inspired change. Thirteen years ago, I walked into a board meeting as creative director and left as a CEO. We were a small company. We were going after a market we'd been told didn't exist. There was no reason to believe we'd make it. But we did, and the next year too. And as the years went by, we were no longer just surviving, we were thriving. Today, I want to share the process that enabled me to find and keep my voice, uh, to co-create a company with like-minded people, and to stand my ground, ground in the games industry. Live, rise, choose, create. Everywhere I go, I meet brilliant people inside and outside the game industry. And they wish something could be done about the lack of diversity, creativity, and the dwindling passion. But I've learned to love it when people tell me something can't be done. I really do. I no longer see a barrier. What they're really saying is they can't do it. Uh, I see an opportunity because I already know anything is possible. We all have innate gifts, a secret sauce that's truly valuable. Some of us may know it's there or may not know it's there, and some may know, not know yet how to find it. There's nothing more powerful than someone who has found their purpose through passion. And recently I did. So to tell my story and the story of Her Interactive, I need to talk about the state of the industry first. Every year games get better. There are games on the market that approach high art. The problem is the entertainment gaming industry is not making those games. The games are coming from the indies. Business has overtaken creativity in the game industry, and it shows in the declining quality of industry output. In one of the most creative industries in the world, creativity in leadership is nowhere to be found because it's not valued. As an industry, we want players to be as white and straight as the men on the money they hand us. At this point, even straight white men are saying, hey, enough, let's get some diversity in here. So that's where things are today. But really, that's where they were when I started 15 years ago. How can we thrive in a system that doesn't welcome diversity? To understand, really, the, the point is, I, I used to think it was sexism. And I actually was angry, and I got angrier as the years went by. But over the past six months, um, since I left her interactive and started Contagious Creativity, I realized it's not. Sexism is like here. It's a lack of wisdom and leadership. And that, when I realized that, I all of a sudden, my anger turned to compassion. It's like, oh, okay. Uh -huh. uh, I chose, I wish I had an elephant there. Um, for the, <laughs> um, but I chose to buck and recreate the system. And my first step was to look for life lessons. My dad was a stockbroker who create, he, he respected creativity. And that was a really good thing because my mom was wildly creative. When we got stains on our clothes that wouldn't wash out, she would sew daisies on them. Mom created beauty in everything she touched, houses, clothes. She played piano by ear, she danced, she painted, she drew. She also knew where she stood. When girls weren't allowed to play tennis, she simply demanded equality and got it. So that was it. I vowed then, when the rules don't make sense, figure out how to change them for the better. And since I, had, and since I found that so many rules made little to no sense, I learned how to always look for solutions. In other words, I was inspired most of the time. It was positive play and practice all at once. After 11 years, I moved to Seattle to tell stories interactively. My goal was to shine a light on the wisdom of women versus the accepted stereotypes. Microsoft offered me a job as a content producer. And there, I had my first brush with corporate culture, traditional leadership. Creative collaboration had no place there because politics was the designated way of getting things done. And everyone accepted it. Everyone knows what that feels like, right? 
uh, rise. You may stumble, you may be pushed, but choose to rise. I took position with her interactive as creative director for the first Nancy Drew computer game. I had no idea um, how to make games, except for I like to play them. I uh, had no idea there were pretty much no video games for girls at the time. Choose. Choose your own Nancy. Set the bar high. Aspire to be someone better so complacency never sets in. Plus, Nancy Drew was a huge inspiration for me growing up. She was smart, gutsy, independent, resourceful, and she always won. Um, so a lot, she, along with my mom, gave me the compass at an early age to live fully. And these kinds of memories fuel my passion. We now have the game, a story-telling vehicle, to blow past those ridiculous stereotypes. We spoke truth to power, and as creative director, I had the power to create the conditions for collective intelligence through creative collaboration. We created a game for a world where girls and women are respected. And retailers across the country res responded with a resounding, no thank you. This was an un unexpected response, but we knew that world where girls and women were respected wasn't imaginary. It, we just had to prove it. Around that time, our games weren't being picked up for retail, and our CEO resigned. Her interactive was, um, closing her interactive was actually on the table. The board chair looked at me and said, we think you can do it. I got so pale, they took me in another room and gave me a glass of water. <laughs> and that's how I became CEO. <laughs> I wasn't sure exactly um, how the CEO thing worked, but I knew we could do it. Three months in, I was drowning. I was sure a mistake had been made, and I soon to be revealed to be the imposter that I was. My increasing fear tempted me to resign because I didn't have the right external skills. I gave in to fear, and I believed that they needed a real CEO who had financial and business skills. I told my boyfriend at the time, and he said, look, for whatever reason they chose you, you're resourceful, so go learn. And I did, and I married him. <laughs> but in my fear, I had forgotten myself, really. Uh, bit by bit, I began to remember the times in my life I turned adversity into adventure. In high school, I was a sports team captain compared to the hockey, to, in hockey, and compared to the competition, we sucked. We were, we were doomed, and except for one thing, we really wanted to win. We unleashed that passion to such an agree, a degree that we managed to achieve the unachievable. Here's how it happened. Our pep and spirit captain had a minor car accident with a man who turned out to change our fate. He was a sky rider. We somehow persuaded this man to fly his plane and write the words, fly with golds, over our field five minutes before we started our game. This was in exchange for a tiny little ad in our brochure. And once we saw our friend in the sky, the rest was history. Our collective passion and motion felt more like a dance in slow motion than an effort. We won two to nothing. That girl, that authority, joins me today when I'm facing down incredible odds. That day I learned not only the power of leadership, but the magic of a connected team. I may have had the leadership role, but everyone was leading. Since I didn't know how to be a CEO, I decided to just keep doing what I do. I was open about what I knew, and probably more importantly, what I didn't know. I was told, you are to serve the board. I thought, of course, but shouldn't I also serve the employees and the customers? Doesn't that end up serving the board? If I had simply served the board, I would have become insensitive and indifferent to the customers and employees. I would have had defended the status quo, and nothing would have changed except me. We need bravery to identify bravery. We, if, if you surround yourself with emotionally sound, curious, and caring people, you can handle anything. You need intuition to filter the advice and criticism you'll receive, and trust me, there will be plenty. You need discipline to access the endurance to run this race. There's some pain involved, and it gets messy sometimes, but it's more than worth it. It leads to both razor-sharp clarity and integration of both the head and the heart. 
These are the conditions for creative collaboration that bows to collective intelligence, that self-organizes, accomplishes, and turns work into play. You may be a Six Sigma black belt, but if you want to bring a creative product to market, you have to first manifest your best self. We pooled our talents to produce the first Nancy Drew game, and there was a lot of chaos being the first game in the series. And that worked to our advantage, basically. We were all learning. Inspired by Nancy Drew, we approached everything like a fun mystery to be solved. In the game, just like the game we were creating. We found clues and new evidence, interrogating suspects was a daily thing. Playfulness, creativity, respect, authenticity, and support were the norm. Everyone acted as protective culture steward, stewards from that point forward. We didn't want to ruin the flow of collective creativity because it would hurt the bottom line. We encouraged multi-dimensional, convergent, and divergent thinking. I sensed what or who was needed in the moment. In my eyes, people worked with me, not for me. I guided more than managed. We were aware of the market profile, the negative stereotypes of girls as weak, and we threw that right out the window. Girls needed to become powerful at a much earlier age. We knew inspired experiences had the potential to inspire transformation. We asked girls what they liked and disliked in existing games, and their fresh perspectives actually helped us to improve on existing gameplay rather than perpetuate stereotypes. We made a great inspiring game and presented it to traditional leadership, and they thought differently. They told us, sorry, females are computer phobic, and so there's no market for them and no shelf space. As a young company in untested waters, we had to be equally creative on the business end. As CEO, I had access to external skills, but also innate skills. It's like gathering up secret ingredients um, or magical powers if you nurture them. We were working in the service of our customers and the product versus just the bottom line, and it paid off in spades. We blew right past the publishers and started selling on Amazon, and it worked. We got on the retail shelves immediately. Our fans sent us thousands of testimonials telling us that they were so inspired by these games, they went on to become scientists, cryptologists, NASA engineers, detectives even, because um, they were just so excited. Uh, and last year, one of our fans, Rachel, contracted terminal cancer at age 16. Make-A-Wish Foundation called me to say that her dying wish was to meet us. We did. Rachel got her wish and passed away one hour after we left. And that remains my proudest moment. We dedicated that game to her. The fans took over and celebrated her on the message boards. The positively creative culture we co-created still lives through our customers today, 15 years later. Together we defy the odds, just like Nancy Drew. Um, and I'm not saying I'm the only one leading this way there. I follow in the footsteps of my hero companies like Double Fine, Telltale, Stormfront Studios, Humongous, and many indies. Of course, when paradigms change, it takes a while for new ones to take hold. And when the economy tanked, we had to lay off 11 people. Most employees had been with us for many years, so I dreaded it. Um, but then I realized we can approach it the same way we approach everything else. Uh, we didn't take the keys and have security walk them out the door. We told them how much we valued them and how we would try to help them find jobs. Everyone had a part to play in the organization instead of going into freeze mode, which is so uncomfortable and awkward. Until very recently, I didn't understand how to make this positive flow of energy sustainable or, or um, expandable until the period of economic collapse. And that's when I got a wake-up call. Like many others, I succumbed to fear, associated with high and prolonged anxiety. And I noticed that our collective energy started to dissipate during this period. I felt unsettled, like I wasn't in my body, just in my head. Fortunately, we survived as a company. But I knew in those moments that my creative flow was missing. I lost access to it. I felt half alive. And I knew that I had a ed negative impact on others. So I decided at that moment, I would never let that happen again. I started to learn how to fully apply myself to become mindful 
to live in the moment, to learn to renounce fear. I thought I'd mastered that in the past, but I hadn't yet. There's nothing like a big, scary, economy-tanking challenge to remind me I had more to learn. But that experience made me think about why traditional leaders still hold on to control tactics when they consistently hurt the bottom line. And I've experienced my share of bias as a woman, a creative, and a non-traditional CEO. But I found it more interesting than off-putting. It made me so curious to better understand how things actually operated at the top. John Gertzema from the Athena Doctrine says, codes of control, aggression, black and white thinking have led to many of the problems we face, growing inequality, income inequalities, war, and scandal. If you think about it, in the US, we encourage boys to not express their emotions at age 13. Each, boy, each year, boys lose more connection to their heart, to themselves, and to others. And when they become adults, it's not that the emperor has no clothes. He doesn't know they're missing or where to find them. This may be nobody's fault, but it's every, it becomes everyone's responsibility to change a leadership model that serves no one. Leadership requires good character as much as good business skills. Casimir Dabrowski, uh, a psychiatrist and psychologist, reviewed the role of logic in development and concludes that intellect alone does not fully help us know what to do in life. Emotion, how one feels, how one senses, is the more accurate guide to life's major decisions. What's more, emotional intelligence incorporates intellect into the moment-by-moment -moment decisions. It's not true the other way around, as we can see with the leadership around the world. In today's world, external skills are becoming less valuable, especially with overseas competition. Most anything we know, uh, excuse me, most anything we need to know can be Google. It's the inner skills, those intangible talents that show up when called for, that are now becoming most valuable. The world is not broken, but our leaders are. This is the first time in history we are conscious of being conscious. I think we finally have the privilege of earning the right to be human. This type of leadership has several names, but it's really human leading leadership, leading with grace. John Mayo once said, it's not about how to make the world more technological, but how to make our world more human. What is called for is a collective shift to mindfulness, to consciousness. Why now? It's time, the ecosystem imbalance, the financial corruption, and the disconnectedness in an uber-connected world. In traditional leadership, crisis equals fear-based behaviors. With creativity, crisis equals better possibilities. Her interactive success was no accident. I recently founded Contagious Creativity with like-minded people to support leaders to create the conditions for collective intelligence. Being inspired is the point. So we can play with other industries to artfully reimagine our world coming from our hearts. So we can become proud of the industries we work in. With mindfulness, we can reboot the current human operating system by connecting to our entire selves first, and then others, and every other living thing in our universe. I respect and salute all of you. Not just your courage, but your power, your team power, to co-create your own companies. If what I've said resonates, go co-create those cultures using your best selves. And to show my support, I, I, my talk was going to be too long, so I have some uh, handout tips to give to you. Thank you. Thank you. So Megan, um, to, if you would share, how do we go forward with this contagious creativity? If I work in a large um, organization, financial services, um, so I'm thinking about work that is informal creativity with informal groups. You know, perhaps also 
something in the firm but outside the firm um, to get this started and going? Um, well, I can talk to you about it offline as well. But um, there are um, several products underneath Contagious Creativity, but the first um, the, the first product, debut product, will be what we're calling Collaboratory. And Collaboratory will be um, an experiential offsite um, or experiential conference where we can help leaders to make the shift to be leading from their heart. Because it really, being in the moment is the point. And so to really experience what that feels like um, I think is important. You know, there are really powerful exercises that can be done, um, and that's, you know, that's the first step. Um, but there's also um, ways to do that within your organizations that I can talk to you about. There's been a lot of great speakers, but I don't know if you guys actually go out and speak to young girls as far as, you know, like between 8 and 12 year olds, yeah. as far as, you know, being in technology and being women and as far as their careers and what their vision of themselves should be. I've learned a lot and I would just, I know that, you know, um, girls and students need to hear the same types of conversations. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm Totally available. <laughs> I, I, I mean, girls and women are what I'm passionate about. Yeah. I mean, you guys in the beginning, but what are you up to now? Are you still continuing with her? Is there a new information that you're writing? No, so um, I left Turner Active about nine months ago, and um, Contagious Creativity is um, what I'm starting. Yeah. So I should have that in the talk. That's okay. I Yeah. Sure. May I have a quick question, actually? You said you felt after three months of taking the CEO position of for drowning and that somehow you can be revealed as an imposter. So from that point on, like, how much of it is fake it till you make it? Or if we, we all believe that we're not good enough and that other people are better at what we're doing, you know, at what point did you feel like, no, oh, I got this and, and I am the right person for this job? Um, I think, you know, I struggled with that for, for a while, but I think the flow, the consistent creative flow, and we kept overcoming so many obstacles, we couldn't believe it. I mean, we just kept going, and I remember that's how we documented our culture, because, um, you know, Paul Allen had the company Purple Moon, and that went under, and a reporter called me and said, well, what do you, how, why do you think you guys can do it? You know, we didn't have $5 million. Um, and um, so I think, um, you know what really helped is just the support, the team support, and the energy. Um, and I remember emailing someone going, wow, we you know, overcame that obstacle, and I think it's because of this, what do you think? And they would write back, and that ended up being our culture document. We documented what we were already doing. Um, it's just when you are in a supportive, respectful, creative, fun environment where everyone truly cares about each other, you can do anything. And that's what it was like for, for most of the years. And when I left, I, uh, I remember going, well, what is it that I do? Like, I honestly could not articulate what I did until probably three months ago, since I, I went to the Wisdom 2.0 conference. And that's when I got the aha, that it was a process. It is a creative process. Um, so I felt that I, ha I could share that experience and process with people to help them uh, co-create cultures in, in this way. Somebody said earlier, we have to be the ones who identify the elephant in the room, and it takes bravery and um, 
you know, there are many other people like me uh, who feel exactly the same way, and so I've gotten a lot of really good support from thought leaders across industry as well as people in the gaming industry. So I look at this as a, mo a wisdom movement. Um, you know, it, it, it has to, you know, get its traction, but it certainly is something, I mean, I was thinking in history, nothing's ever been changed without a movement. So it's got to start somewhere. And then to answer your other question, um, we're co-designing right now, we have about 12 people, we're co-designing uh, the Collaboratory, which is our first conference um, that will be in about a year to really help leaders and support and facilitate them to make the shift to have more collaborative um, ways of interacting so everyone's creativity is unleashed, not just a few people at the top. Okay, let's right. go Thank you.